Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome and thanks uh, for joining us for this webinar today. We're going to start uh, in a few minutes to let everybody come in. So just stay with us. If you want, in the meantime, you can go to the chat and write down your name and uh, where you are calling from, or which organization you're working with, so we know a little bit more who is the expertise in the room. That would be really nice. Okay, we have already we approximately 56 people now who have joined. So again, thank you very much for joining us today in the, this webinar. Um, we, uh, my name is Astrid de Vallon. I'm leading the WFP work uh, at global level on digital financial inclusion and uh, women economic empowerment. And the main objective of our discussion today, we wanted to explore how cash transfers can support digital financial inclusion of women and men, and this specifically in the Asia Pacific region. So we'll be together for 90 minutes. And uh, what is very important for us is to really to hear from you. Uh, we really want to listen to your experience. So we'll not hear only from the great panelists that I will introduce soon, but we really would like to hear your voice, your expertise, uh, the challenges you are we're facing in this subject, the opportunities. So let me start with explaining how we'll uh, spend these 90 minutes together. So I'll start with a short introduction. Um, so explaining the links between cash transfer digital financial inclusion. And then I will introduce uh, our panelists who will be there today with us. And we'll then display a short poll uh, online because we have a few questions to ask you. So we'll ask you to type your answers uh, to the poll and comment on these answers. And our two colleagues from the ODI will present the key findings on the study they have carried out uh, with uh, WFP in the Asia Pacific region, which is the focus of today. And we have other panelists uh, who have joined us uh, today, uh, who will then give us specific examples on how the recommendations from the study can be operationalized concretely. And we want to keep then half an hour of discussion. That's very important for us because we want to hear from you. How will that work? Uh, you will see at the bottom of your screen, there is a chat box. There is also a Q&A box. You can choose whichever you want to type in your question, your remarks, your examples, and we'll try and pick them and ask our panelists to answer uh, some of your thoughts or bounce back on some uh, your question. We want to, to do a very lively conversation. Uh, so let's uh, try and all uh, listen to uh, the different points that we have to bring up. Maybe let me start with the, um, the global picture. So the World Bank recently reported um, that the, during the pandemic, uh, there were cash transfer. And this cash transfer covered 763 uh, million people. So basically, we have a huge amount of people who have been reached by digital cash transfer. This is always increasing. And we know that money gives women and men greater freedom, uh, give them choice, 
the sense of control over their lives and the dignity. And this is so important in terms of in times of crisis. So uh, there are two aspects to it. So the humanitarian cash transfer that, for instance, WFP is uh, doing, but also the government to people payment. And this is way larger because we're talking about government really sending cash to their people. All of this can be an opportunity for women and men to get the first time access to a financial account, a formal financial account, and it can also incite them to increase their usage of this account, but also other services that are linked to this account. And this is all the more true for people who are usually unbanked or underserved and that use informal uh, financial services for their business. So if we all here start designing um, our cash transfer uh, to help women and men be digitally financially included, this has a really large impact. For instance, women and men can access payments, they can access savings, they can access maybe credit, they can even access insurance. And we know how important it is with the climate change to get, for instance, climate insurance. So all of these uh, aspects related to the supply side of the products linked with aspects related to providing women and men with financial education, with customer protection, this will help the women and men we serve better cope with the shocks, including the shocks related to climate change. What we would like all uh, is really to build women and men's financial resilience. We want them to be active actors so that they can invest in the futures, that they can realize their aspiration, and for that they need usually access to financial services. So uh, in 2021, uh, WFP uh, sent 2.3 billion US dollar of cash to 41 million people. Uh, cash is always more important for the World Food Program. 34% of our portfolio is actually sending cash. And we are also always more supporting government. Uh, and in COVID time, many government asked WFP to help to send cash to their people who are hard to reach because that's really what we are good at doing. And our objective is to support 10 million women to get their own uh, financial account by 2028. And we want to support their financial health, their resilience and their empowerment. And so we want to do that by providing women with the knowledge, the trust, the skills to take full advantage of economic opportunities. We want to encourage also the financial service providers or the private sector to look at the women and men we serve as a really um, a, a segment of clients that are also interesting for the private sector. And we want them to do it in a way that respects the rights of the men and the women. And we want also to work more with central banks to be sure that the national regulation are supportive uh, of the most uh, unbanked and vulnerable women and men. Let's go now to focus, uh, let's focus on this study for the Asia Pacific region. Um, basically, why did WFP commission a study to ODI for the Asia Pacific region? There is a um, very um, evolving, rapidly evolving digital land landscape in the Asia Pacific region. And I'm sure many of you attending uh, working in this region, so it would be good to hear about your view on that. And so there is always more demand on uh, the government and on international actors to be more engaged in the national digital transformation agenda. And this includes digital financial inclusion. In uh, the Asia Pacific region, WFP work um, also on the subject of digital financial inclusion. For instance, through doing cash transfer program, as we explained, cash transfer program can be one first step towards digital financial inclusion. Through helping governments, supporting national government, providing them digital advisory services. So this is a solution um, for national uh, social protection actors. And through also highlighting the possibility of exclusion that exists uh, when uh, national um, social protection programs are um, put in place and ensuring that we avoid this exclusion. And we have in our panel um, an expert, for instance, on uh, people living with disability who will talk uh, to us about that. The, the 
study that was carried out uh, was aiming uh, at providing an overview of digital financial inclusion in the Asia Pacific region. And the idea was to provide WFP, but also other stakeholders um, with ideas on how to best uh, work uh, to support women and men being digitally financially included. There was an external advisory group of specialists from different um, areas and institutions across the globe who fed into the study. And so we're really uh, glad that we have our colleagues from ODI today who will present uh, the study. So maybe we'll pass to introduce the panelists of today. And uh, so first we have our two researchers and um, we have uh, from ODI, we have Moisa and uh, we have Moisa Sarah and Stephanie Deepiven. And um, you can, of course, read their detailed biography on the slide. But I, what I wanted to highlight for today's discussion is the special angle that Moisa brings. She has a specific expertise in social protection policies with a focus on cash transfer. Stephanie herself, she has done years of research on digitalization and governance. She has a focus um, on how political and social outcomes are affected through the use of data and digital technologies. And then we have um, our panelists. So we have Barnaby, Barnaby Willits King. He joined GSMA in November, 2021. I hope everybody knows who GSMA is, otherwise uh, Barnaby, you will explain. Um, but it's very important from the, to have the private sector perspective because GSMA confederate um, all the mobile uh, network operators uh, in the world. Um, and so, so Barnaby is focusing on, um, he's a research and policy director in the Mobile for Humanitarian uh, Innovation Program. So his work focuses on the role of digital technology in humanitarian crisis. And also, which is very important to building responsible digital ecosystems. And that includes the regulatory issues. So the work with central banks, et cetera. And then we have also Clara Setiawan. Uh, she's ICFT lead on cash and voucher assistance. So she'll share from her large experience in operational and advocacy role in many small to large scale operations from uh, the uh, Red Cross movement. So she was with the Canadian Red Cross, IFSC, now she's with ICFT. And we also have Manuel Roti. Manuel is a senior program officer and a cash uh, focal point in the humanitarian team of CBM Global. Manuel will explain a few words about uh, CBM Global, but basically he will bring his expertise on disability inclusion in humanitarian cash assistance and disaster risk uh, reduction. So I'll stop there. Um, I think uh, we are now have a good number of people in the room, uh, almost, yeah, almost 100. So I'm handing over to Moisa for the quiz. Thank you, Moisa. Great, thanks so much for that introduction, Astrid. Um, for audience members, we're going to run a two question poll. And the first question should appear on your screens now. And I'll also read it out in case you don't have access to the screens. So I'm just waiting for the question to appear. There we go. So the question is um, asking you and to sp think specifically about the work you do with the populations you work with. Do you think that digital financial products and we're thinking about, you know, mobile money accounts, digital banking accounts, digital products, uh, ways that people can save and access credit. Do you think these are well designed for the men and women you work with? So we're not asking about the average population, we're asking about men and women you work with. So if you take one of those options, it'll come up. Um, we'll be able to see the results soon. And I will pass over for question two to my colleague, Stephanie. Um, great, thanks, Amaza. So for question two, um, this is an open-ended question um, that follows up on the first one. Um, and what we'd like you to consider, um, and maybe type your responses into the chat um, as you think about them. And this question is, for the men and women that you work with, what are the main barriers to using digital financial products? So thinking, what are the main barriers that you see? And if you could um, post your answers into the chat um, as, they, as you think about them, um, we'll continue to sort of take responses to it and reflect on them. Um, 
as we go. And now just as you sort of think about your answers, I'll hand back to my colleague, Moisa. Great, thanks so much. So I'm going to, as we wait for both um, answers to the first question of the poll to come in as well as the second, I'm going to start sharing my screen um, so we can go into bits of the research. So please let me know uh, if you can see the screen. Yes. Great, Great, fantastic. So um, I, <laughs> I'm waiting to see the answers of the first question of the poll, but we can move on as we go, go um, into the findings. And just to say, you know, what you're typing in the chat is really interesting because this does, some of this links to what we found and some of this does, okay. So we have the answer to the first question of the poll that for the practitioners in this room, they don't think the majority, almost 70%, don't think that digital financial products are well designed for the men and women they work with. Interestingly, almost 30% do. And we would really like to hear from these 30% because it would be great to hear what are the products in specific you're thinking about. So please be as specific as possible if you want to contribute to this conversation and kind of type in the chat, what is the product you're thinking about? What is its feature that you think is actually really good for the men and women you work with uh, who are recipients of cash transfers? But the second, the answers to the second questions that I can see coming in, we'll, we'll be able to pick them up and you'll see them reflected in some of the findings of the presentation. So let me just, sorry, minimize the chat a bit. Um, as Astrid mentioned, uh, our main interest in this research was examining whether cash transfers delivered to low-income men and women hold the potential for financial inclusion in general and digital financial inclusion in specific. So we define financial inclusion as the increased ability of individuals and households to save, make payments, and access uh, credit and in specific non-predatory credit, which can then lead to improvements in their economic and social well-being. So our understanding of financial inclusion makes clear that access um, alone is not inclusion, but the ability to use that access to improve economic conditions is what brings in the inclusionary aspect. And within this, we see digital financial inclusion as one way of achieving financial inclusion more broadly um, and this occurs, digital financial inclusion in specific, is when individuals or households can make use of online and digital ways of making payments, digital ways of saving and credit to improve their financial health. Before we dive into the spaces that we found in our research for introducing or bringing in digital financial inclusion, um, a few notes on the methods for this work. So we complemented a uh, fairly broad literature review, which looked at the interaction between social protection, financial inclusion, and digital financial inclusion, uh, with primary data collection in three countries where there is in the Asia Pacific uh, that had a significant presence of cash transfer programs, which have evolved over time. So in Bangladesh, Cambodia, and Nepal. And in these three countries, we carried out interviews uh, in with respect recipients of cash transfers, both in focus group settings and for people with disabilities in paired um, key informant interviews. We followed this up with a separate set of key informant interviews at the country level, at the regional level, as well as at the global level with experts or people who've been following the space of social protection and digital finance um, over a long period of time. So a brief, again, a second brief note on the program and this I want to kind of the reason I'm bringing this in is because I think it's important for this to know exactly what the modality of the cash transfer was. So in Bangladesh we looked at the disaster risk reduction program which is run by the World Food Program for host communities in Cox's Bazar. This is a cash for work program for both men and women and respondents receive cash on a Bcash account. Bcash is a mobile money financial service um, and it's linked to a SIM card. Typically, our respondents would, when they had, when money came in, they would cash it out in the sense they would convert that online money into cash at a Bcash agent. In Cambodia, we looked at two programs. We looked at the government's emergency COVID-19 uh, 
cash grant as well as a long-term grant for low-income women and children under the age of two, which was given in three tranches. And in this program, we saw that the digital component or what was digitalized was often at the back end, by which we mean um, where at the, at the end of constructing um, how beneficiaries or recipients were identified, maintaining that list, and then the transfer of funds and interaction between the government, which was the provider of the cash grant, and the financial service provider, which in this case was a, a banking, online banking service known as Wing. And again, in in this context, we saw that recipients, once they got a notification that the transfer had come through, would typically go to a local wing agent and cash out. Um, in Nepal, we looked at recipients of the government's social security allowance. And in again, similar, a little bit similar to Nepal, uh, to Cambodia, cash transfers were mostly digital at the back end. The registry was increasingly being digitalized and the transfer of money was made to the financial service provider, which was one of the local banks, and recipients would walk to a local bank agent and cash out the money. So, so in the Asia Pacific overall, we found for most part that cash transfers were digital as at what we call the back end, and for recipients of cash transferred access to, they, they prioritize non-digital access to money for most parts. So given this landscape of payment mechanisms to recipients, we identified both opportunities and challenges in the potential for cash transfers to be a vehicle for digital financial inclusion. So first, the opportunities. Um, for some of our respondents in Nepal and in Cambodia, this cash transfers was often their first individual link with the formal financial system. So the, the account they needed for the cash transfer was an important step towards broader financial inclusion, not just because of the account itself, you know, as a space where people can save money and make and receive payments, but equally importantly, the value of having an account that allowed them to build familiarity and trust in a formal financial institution and its products. So the opportunity is there. It's not always converted into that trust and familiarity, but the opportunity exists. Secondly, for respondents who had previously had to travel long distances, often to disbursement centers to receive physical cash, the movement towards local money agents or ATM points in urban areas in specific was a point that they spoke about with relief and convenience because it saved them both the cost and time and transport to travel. But also if one agent was closed for whatever reason in urban areas, they could go to a closer agent where distribution was higher. This was often not the opportunity available in the rural areas, but in the urban areas there was, there was that flexibility. So again, aspirationally, the convenience that we see inherent in digital financial transactions that a lot of us use in supportive settings has the potential to be cost saving in real ways for recipients. Uh, and finally, again, this was not a common experience, but one of our respondents did indicate that having a mobile men account meant that although she cashed out most of her cash transfer every time it came through, she did keep a small amount from each transfer as savings towards the goal of financing her child's education. And she was reassured by being able to see this money in her account whenever she needed reassured, that reassurance. So onto the challenges that stop this access to often an account or an online account to be converted into inclusion or inclu converted into engaging with savings and credit in a way that improve economic settings. In the first instance, uh, the population we're speaking about, cash transfer recipients, is engaged often in subsistence level work and enterprises. And their income flow in their perception is just enough to meet their needs. So they often perceive that engaging with formal financial institutions for savings or credit was for rich people, those who did not need the cash transfers because, and those who had enough money left over from daily expenditures to be able to do something else with it. Engaging with finance, formal financial institutions was seen as something else. Um, many expressed that they prefer to cash out entirely. And if they saved, they saved informally for emergencies because they needed immediate access and that setting up savings and payments through banks seemed incredibly time and effort intensive. And they didn't think the benefits matched that level of effort. 
And we thought this was partly tied in to the lack of infrastructure that would support spread and familiarity with financial institutions, particularly in the rural areas in our samples. So, um, and, and what we mean by that is obviously having the kind of infrastructure for electricity, uh, mobile signals and internet that would allow this to be in place in the first, in the first instances. And unsurprisingly, given the, the difference in infrastructure often between urban and rural areas, in most communities that we interviewed where our respondents lived, local businesses and tradespeople conducted transactions exclusively in cash or on promise of cash later. So very short term credit, often with no interest. Again, supporting the rationale for why people chose to cash out. Cash was also the predominant method of credit because it was often needed in small amounts and there was a high preference for going to neighbors and relatives because of a very low interest rate. Um, we, one of the challenges that we identified that can be addressed is also that training for respondents um, focused often on how to receive the cash transfer, but it wasn't often matched by what are the products associated that are helpful or can bring actual value to the daily lives of the recipients. Bank agents and money agents also did not inform uh, respondents of savings or credit products that might be relevant to them. And finally, there is amongst our respondents a perceived high risk of misconduct by unfamiliar formal financial institutions. And I've mentioned this before, but this was particularly striking in self, some respondents self-report. Because even when they admitted and mentioned and spoke about how money lenders charge a higher rate of interest than perhaps compared to a bank, they still found it preferable because it was easier to access and they perceived there was more accountability in case anything went wrong. Which goes back to our poll question on whether financial products meet the needs of low income and marginalized people. And by which we mean, are these products cognizant of the insecurity of the environment in which people make decisions? Um, so we also observed some differences amongst the population of respondents. We observed a gender difference in our sample in both how people accessed cash, as well as conducting financial transactions generally. So women more than men, and older women more than older men in our sample indicated that they required support. Another person to help them cash out the cash transfer, often despite a training. And this would could be a bank agent, but sometimes would be a neighbor. Uh, they also indicated that they would go and need support to top up their mobile phone. Even though they mentioned that they could see that men in their household could use something that looked like a QR code. So there was a real difference, even within the same household, in how people engaged with it, um, and which obviously is important in thinking about empowerment and what that looks like. Within household, women reported that decision making on household expenditure had not really changed in that they were before and after cash transfer, regardless of its modality, still responsible for choices on food, but that they acknowledged the cash transfer, the amount of the money allowed them to buy a greater variety of food consumption, a greater variety. But access to a bank account or cash transfer didn't seem to lead to changes in gendered roles or opportunities to start businesses or own work. Amongst people with disabilities in our sample, people reported reliance on able-bodied household members both to receive and cash out cash transfers as well as engaging with mobile money agents. Often this degree of reliance was a function of the nature of disability. For example, one blind respondent we interviewed talked about relying entirely on their sibling to do everything to do with the cash transfer. And the final point on this slide is from our literature view. We didn't really see any adaptations in technology for people with disability in the sample of cash transfers we looked at. But we saw in the literature, there has been you know, lots of analysis that shows that emphasis in technology often tends to be on assistive technology, which is uh, an after the fact add on solution, something like screen readers or speech to text programs, et cetera, which can be resource incentive, uh, intensive to obtain, but also are often obsolete by the time they come out. So, and, and of, in, in this corpus of 
um, literature, the emphasis is on going towards universal design as a starting point. So not an add-on, but a starting point when thinking about technology. And then on my final slide, I think, which is just a sort of overview of the insights we have from this primary work. I think, first of all, it's worth noting that these challenges have been spoken about in academic literature on financial inclusion for many years, and they're not new to analysts or policymakers. But these challenges, despite this widespread knowledge, persist today in 2022 for low income and marginalized populations. And the optimism that came in the sort of aftermath of the pandemic that now, you know, online modes of financial transaction would be universal does not seem to be that straightforward for the most marginalized populations. And I think it's key to emphasize that statistics on average access and inclusion will hide the experience of those most marginalized. So the idea that everyone has somehow mobile phones or everyone has digital access is for, for the populations that we within the social protection, humanitarian protection community look at, those average statistics often tend to not apply. Um, so one, one point that came out was that our respondents, particularly, and this came out very clearly in Bangladesh, reported that once the cash transfer ended, they actually stopped using Bcash until the next cash transfer came around. So often it was used to receive cash transfer, but not again integrated into their daily lives. Generally, though, there are some observations about how people live their financial lives that I think can be key to thinking about digital financial inclusion. The first is that the use of technology amongst trusted users, sellers in the community is, will be a great um, sort of bolster to um, adapt, adopt, adopting digital financial products. But this of course d depends on readily available infrastructure. Secondly, trust in formal banking and mobile systems and trust in the ability that these will be there for you to allow, uh, for you to access cash in an emergency is a necessary element. And how this trust is going to be built up is going to look different in different contexts, particularly if infrastructure landscape remains uneven. Um, secondly, actually having digital financial products, first of all, that meet the needs of people, um, instead of pushing products that might meet the needs of uh, populations that live above the first 20% income quintile above the lowest, the bottom income quintile, I mean. Um, so having those products and then making sure that knowledge about those products is available. Uh, and finally, uh, interoperability amongst providers to allow choice, actual real choice to people and also allow them to make linkages between families, relatives and friends, regardless of location. And I will now hand over to Stephanie. Uh, thanks, Moisa. Um, so what I want to do is follow up on the insights that Moisa just shared about the end users' experiences and of opportunities and challenges um, by reflecting on some of the insights we had on the opportunities and challenges from supply side perspectives. And so this is sort of a general category that covers quite a lot, but here we're thinking about first the private sector and then the organizations that um, deliver the cash. And I think important to note, um, and something we can reflect on after, is that this reflects insights from our research which focused on end users and social protection and humanitarian actors. We didn't directly speak to the private sector. So it's reflections on the private sector from these other actors. So just first to think of then a bit about um, the opportunities and challenges when we involve the private sector in the delivery of cash in relation to digital financial inclusion is that what sort of came out clearly was that there is a really central role that private sector actors play within an enabling ecosystem for digital financial inclusion. They play a critical access, preserve operational access to products um, around first access to an account and also linking up to other financial products and services. And specifically in this, we saw some patterns come out in how the private sector is involved in the roles we play. And around these roles, we see both opportunities and also some challenges for actors working with them, which I'll touch on um, towards the end of this slide. So the specific ways that we saw the private sector being involved was one first, as I mentioned, just sort of in the provision of financial products and services. The, these are actors that are already invested in the financial sector. They've been working at providing um, hopefully secure infrastructure. They're innovating around this. They have a commercial interest in doing so. And so there's a foundation here that's really important um, that can contribute. 
Second, they often played a role in sort of as the bank branches and the agents um, for cash in and cash out services. Also, third, interestingly, and one that's perhaps worth more consideration is around, we saw some opportunity for private sector actors to play a role around interoperability. So here we're thinking of the sharing of data between applications, services, and products, either within a company or between companies for a more seamless, efficient experience for the customer. And arguably governments are sort of critical in creating the regulatory environment for interoperability. But depending also on incentives, infrastructural design, new mobile money providers can also play a role here too. And in some cases we see that in also encouraging and facilitating interoperability as well. And then finally, as has already been touched on, there's also a key role for private sector actors as intermediaries now with backend digital disbursements, introducing new agents um, that become involved in um, this facilitation of cash. As these roles can be, um, just go back a sec, sorry. Um, so we can frame these opportunities, but I just want to sort of briefly mention that these roles also bring some considerations of challenges as well um, that emerge from our interviews with um, end users and also um, humanitarian social protection actors. First, um, in this, as private sector actors become intermediaries around digital disbursements, there can in some cases be premium or fees attached, um, which need to be considered. And also considerations need to take into account um, the development and nature of the financial sector. Is there one dominant private mobile money operator? And if so, what might this mean for interoperability? And we saw in some cases that um, the presence of one dominant provider could actually restrict interoperability. So I think, as your comments also suggested too, this is a consideration of the financial landscape um, and competition and presence of different financial service providers becomes quite important for the extent to which the private sector can play these roles effectively. Um, now, next slide. From the other perspective, um, we also did sort of try to hone in on the opportunities and challenges for humanitarian and social protection actors involved in digitally delivered um, cash. And reflecting the finding that Moisa presented on the end user's experience, there was really a key opportunity here that emerged around enabling first access to financial services. But it became a lot trickier when thinking beyond the first point of access to thinking what's actually required as enabling conditions to make it possible to facilitate digital financial inclusion for the men and women that actors are working with um, on the back of this. I think your comments here about barriers really comes through as well in terms of our findings. So we see that really a systematic approach becomes quite important for actually facilitating the enabling conditions that might make financial inclusion possible. Things around considering digital literacy, um, thinking about phone access and maintenance um, alongside the sort of creation of a mobile money account um, on its end. And that this is sort of critical um, to, th to thinking about the outcomes that are possible. Um, alongside an important challenge, we also came through, that also came through in terms of alongside this opportunity to provide first access to actually think about achieving financial inclusion, a challenge was actually about how ensuring appropriate and sustained access to financial products um, and services, especially for the more marginalized or poor groups that we're thinking about here that perhaps a lot of you are also working with. And so one question that came through was there are there considerations when perhaps digital cash might need to be supplemented by physical cash delivery or verification checks? For example, when a financial system is not yet predominantly digital or in the context of a physical disaster. And the second question was, oh, also how um, another challenge was sort of ensuring that um, the more marginal groups were actually able um, to participate. And here a question has also came out in some of your comments as well around know your customer requirements um, becomes key and what types of ID requirements are required um, in order to enable access. And in some cases we saw adaptations here, um, for example, alternative documentation to prove residents, but then if you reduce the know your customer um, requirements, that can also have implications on the range of services or products someone has access to. So again, some trade-offs here that were really important questions and challenges um, that the actors that we interviewed were really having to grapple with. Um, and so next slide. So just on the back of that, um, I'm going through quite quickly, but I really wanna give time for discussion is I wanna briefly touch on some general recommendations for supply side actors on the back of the end user experiences and perspectives that came through in our research. 
And for the sake of time, I'm just going to present four higher level recommendations, which each compel consideration and tailoring um, to different supply side actors, whether we're thinking of social protection actors or perhaps the private sector. So the first recommendation um, starts closest to the cash recipient and their experience. And it's really about starting with ensuring the agency and attention to the preferences of those who are the recipients of cash. Um, in transitions to digital, especially when financial systems themselves are in transition, um, it's really important to consider concrete options um, for different ways um, that recipients can engage with digital cash and also an alternatives. Really thinking about are the alternatives we're providing people enabling with agency um, that um, a user focus on their preferences and also dignity. Um, and then stepping back from this then, at the more higher level, we come, there's sort of a set of three recommendations here for thinking about how different supply side actors might approach what they do and also work together. So the first is about coordinating priorities. Um, it's clear that there's a lot to be done, especially when we think of the systemic approach. And there's a question here about how different actors can coordinate to avoid duplication and address different aspects to create a more enabling environment. This ties in then to the penultimate recommendation, which is really about social protection actors working more closely um, with local financial players and thinking operationally what works um, and what the needs are within specific contexts. And then finally, um, there's a question about thinking about the cost of all of this. So we really found that a systemic approach, one that takes into account digital literacy, financial literacy, basic literacy, as some of your comments also suggested, is really important. Um, and investing in this in a way that allows for more sustainable and longer term outcomes um, can be costly. And it's costly for different actors in different ways. And so there's a distributional question here um, about cost as well that needs to be taken into account. So one, from a private sector perspective, what's actually profitable? Do we need to think about subsidizing some interventions to ensure access by the more marginalized? Um, from social protection actors and humanitarian actors, is there a consideration for bigger or longer term investments that also take into account um, questions say around, around different forms of literacy? And finally, also thinking about the costs for cash recipients themselves um, that are implicated in all of this. Costs around maintaining phones, ensuring sustained access to data services, thinking beyond and outside of the transfer itself, um, what the costs are there. So with that, I'm going to hand back over um, to the moderator, I think now. Um, thanks. Thank you very much uh, to you both for presenting uh, these findings and thanks for the different uh, people participating who have put some questions. So Ambashu, Hannah, Robley, uh, we saw your input even more Robley. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe before uh, moving on to the next phase where we have our panelists uh, asking questions, I just wanted to raise one question that was asked as a precision question from Moisa. What's the difference between a humanitarian actor and a social protection actor? It would be great maybe to clarify that because before we move further. Moisa, if you can just answer this question. And sure, of, of course. So generally within our field, we would think about humanitarian actors as those who respond to disasters, emergencies, catastrophe, and typically they would not be government actors. Social protection actors are actors who we think of as those who are invested in setting up systems. And these systems can be amenable to responding to humanitarian crises, for example, later on. But largely social protection actors move, work on long-term investment in welfare policies and systems while humanitarian actors don't. And hence the humanitarian actor space generally is seen to be actors who are outside the government and respond to emergencies. While social protection can respond to emergencies, but also has a larger lifespan um, because it is a system of protection. And I think this is an area of interest for WFP, which is linking and making sure that humanitarian actors work more with government social protection actors. Yes, Ruby, social protection actors are government, but you can have social protection actors who are working with the government as well. Um, so over to you, back to you, Astrid. Thank you for the clarification. And so now, if I can ask uh, to have uh, Clara Barnaby Emanuel on video, that would be great. And we're gonna just want to have your reflection. So I'm gonna start with uh, with Barnaby. And uh, so Barnaby, uh, you are representing the largest uh, association of mobile network operators. And so we would like to hear from the supply side perspective, when you've listened to the findings of the study, how does it resonate with you? 
Uh, and also maybe if you can um, uh, give your feedback on the little quiz that was uh, at the beginning and the, not only the first question, but also the, the, the inputs that were provided by the different participants related to the barriers that women and men face uh, for their financial inclusion. So which, uh, what are your thoughts and which concrete recommendation do you have for private sector actors and regulators uh, who, has, who are with us today? Barnaby, to you. Great, thanks so much, Astrid. Um, and yeah, thanks for that really, uh, a lot of interesting, important um, issues to address from the presentation. So let me just give you a little bit of a background on, on the GSMA in case um, you don't know about us. So um, we are the trade association of the mobile industry globally um, with a membership of over 700, 800, I think, mobile operators. Um, and so that includes a lot of contexts where there are humanitarian um, activities. Um, I sit within the non-profit foundation part of the GSMA, and this is a donor-funded, UK-funded programme um, called Mobile for Humanitarian Innovation. Um, so I'm not really talking on behalf of, of the mobile industry, but we work as a broker between the mobile industry and our members uh, and, our, and our partners in the humanitarian sector and governments. And what we're really doing is, I mean, the essence of everything that we're talking about today is really trying to sort of sensitize and come up with practical ways in which we can we can really um, improve the ways that um, the uh, the private sector can work in this space. Um, you know, going beyond the core users that, you know, the richer users, as, as Moisa said, who are the kind of the perhaps the primary target of, of um, the private sector to look at how they they should and could um reach excluded groups and work responsibly you know really important the questions of data sharing which are which are very high up the agenda um, um, and providing the right products providing things that that people need so a, a lot of things resonating from from the discussion so far and we really have we have a vision of an inclusive and an open digital ecosystem where mobile networks and the infrastructure that you need, like, like agents, um, really important, are available, can be expanded and are, and are appropriate. Now, that all sounds great, um, and, and we can all agree that's, that's the way forward, but how do we do that? Um, and what are some of the practical things that, you know, respond to the issues that, um, that we've, we've heard about? Um, we've got a lot of practical experience working with, with governments, working with humanitarian development stakeholders to, to digitize cash transfers, as we heard, you know, this is enormous, this is incredibly, has, has changed the face of the humanitarian industry, but how do we digitize well, how do we build those strong partnerships to, to enable it to work effectively and, you know, at the right price. Digital financial inclusion in the humanitarian sector is definitely having a moment, we're hearing about it more and more. Um, you know, this isn't new in in uh, you know in many quarters academically. This has been something studied for a long time, but it's really important that we get this right and don't don't sort of reinvent the wheel. And I think, particularly thinking about the Asia Pacific region, the the potential is is enormous. So this is really timely. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to to talk and to to have interviewed on the the draft report, and also for the the openness that WFB is taking to kind of sharing these findings and having the discussion because I think. This is a sort of multi-stakeholder thing um, and, and involving the private sector in the conversation, um, I think is really important. And, and the scale that WFP brings to these, these issues is really, really important. Um, so what resonates specifically? I guess a very important starting point, and it's very obvious, but it's good to, to reiterate it, is that, is that giving people cash digitally um, or a bank account or you know mobile money account doesn't automatically lead to financial inclusion and I think we've heard a lot from the study findings about people cashing out straight away so these barriers that um, we heard about from the study and in the chat really understanding that is a lot of the work that, that we have experience of working with our partners to try and understand that and understand that on a context basis what are some of those key barriers so that we understand you know digital financial inclusion isn't an end in itself it's it's something to uh, to to achieve you know financial resilience financial well-being livelihood social protection um so uh there's lots of barriers i mean i could talk about a million million things whether it's literacy affordability of handsets agent networks consumer financial protection um 
there's lots of studies on this. There's lots of examples that, that we can point to um, as more and more operators roll out mobile money. What I wanted to focus on um, was actually looking at the regulatory barriers, um, which, which came up, um, I think, uh, quite a bit in the study and in, in some of the, the sort of interventions so far around actually the space within which you know industry actors like like the mobile industry and fintechs have to operate um because that can be a barrier and that can really constrain the space or it can kind of promote the sort of innovation and the uh, the reach that we're looking at for this to be successful um and that can then unlock a lot of the other things that we you know we've heard about the sort of the need to build trust and the need to have agents who are kind of there as the frontline building trust but but sometimes you can't even get to that point um so, for example, um, you know, for digital financial services, there are often specific regulatory limits to what mobile operators can can offer. One of the things we've done in uh, in in Rwanda, for example, is to work with with World Vision and the mobile operator there to look at how do you digitize village savings and loan associations so that you can have established community groups who are kind of doing um, sort of uh, group based uh, savings and, and, and loans. Um, but you've you've got to have the right permissions from the financial regulators to do that. Um, you can't you can't just offer those services. That's happened in Rwanda. We'd like it to happen in Kenya. Huge potential, as we know, in Kenya to do to do more. But that needs to be approved by the regulator. That requires to pick up on the theme that I think I'll keep coming back to. And you mentioned is is the multi stakeholder um, approach because you know our members, we UN agencies, humanitarian agencies have an ability to work together and go to governments and say look this is a this is an issue that is 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 holding back um a priority which is to you know help marginalized people to help refugees um how can we overcome these barriers um we've heard about id we've heard about some of the know your customer and anti money laundering um regulations which affect you know everybody who who does sort of financial services um coming up with sort of pragmatic solutions sort of understanding what id can be practically available and can be used and talking to governments about about that but also as as stephanie says understanding the trade-offs that that might imply in terms of what that might limit for services and um, the the example that we always talk about is advocacy um among um many of the community in uganda with the um, bank of uganda and the telecoms authorities around the use of government issued attestation letters for refugees in Uganda to be able to um, uh, access services um, linked to UNHCR databases. That doesn't, that happens because we, you have a concerted multi stakeholder approach to change that. And that means that now refugees can, can register SIM cards in their own name and access, access services. There are other, other continuing challenges that I'll, I'll sort of, you know, talk about that, you know, in the context of, um sort of actually then refugees working as agents uh great to be able to employ refugees for refugees to become mobile money agents and in uganda this is something where we saw there was a problem that although they could use mobile money they were not not permitted to work as mobile money agents so again there's a sort of an ecosystem here that everyone needs to work together on to see where that can be expanded because often the challenge then is how do you encourage the service in places that initially there isn't seen to be a market, but actually evidence can be presented and, and business cases built for, for, for the industry. And we've partnered in Uganda with, with the Grameen Foundation on, on how do you expand those networks? How do you make it possible for refugees to work as mobile money agents and train them so that they're actually working in an inappropriate way? So all of that to say, I mean, the, the, the finding clearly we, you know great to hear the central role of the private sector we see it all the time um the, the need to kind of use the innovation of the private sector but how do we make that work well i mean how do we actually capitalize on that how do we address some of these barriers i think this sort of getting the partnerships right and understanding that it's about you know getting what what paying for what you need as a service and and paying for the right expertise and finding the right provider to fit with what 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 what's needed in terms of really understanding the particular requirements of the humanitarian sector and um, the issues around inclusion. We do a lot of sort of matchmaking between 
um, humanitarians and different mobile operators, some of whom have experience of working in the sector and, and some of whom don't, designing the services together so that it's there's a business case. This isn't just a, you know, a corporate social responsibility activity, but it is big business. And that's something which, you know, is attractive. There's a market. There isn't always an additional awareness that the market is big. And so actually saying, look, you know, some of the most profitable mobile phone towers in Africa are in refugee camps. Um, so thank you, Werner, for all this input already. Uh, maybe for the interest of, uh, of time and leaving a bit of uh, space also for the question that the floor has, uh, uh, the people have sent. Uh, we're going to maybe move to um, our next uh, panelist and really keeping in mind the key points that you said about, yes, there is definitely a market and it's not a question of corporate social responsibility. And we have work to do together to, uh, to ensure that the regulation is favorable to make this uh, this market attractive for the private sector. Um, so thank you, Barnaby, for, for this. And we're going to come back to you maybe with uh, some questions that are uh, that uh, were typed in the Q&A box. Um, so I'm going to now hand over to Manuel. Um, so Barnaby, you already mentioned inclusion. And Manuel, you have a specific expertise uh, in ensuring that women and men living with disabilities are included in cash transfer. As we know, uh, globally in the world, in any population, women and men living with disabilities are 15% uh, as a minimum. And usually in the people that we serve or that receive cash transfer, this percentage is higher. So what are the specific challenges they face uh, to become digitally financially included? What should we do to remove these barriers? And we had a very good point from Morali in the chat. Uh, who seems to also have uh, been working on the same subject related to uh, what needs to be done also from the private sector perspective to include uh, people with disability from the onset so to have this universal design so maybe if you want also to say a few words for those who are not familiar with the idea of universal design so manuel up to you thank you very much astrid uh, for this good question and also thank you for the opportunity to speak in this panel. So indeed, there are a number of barriers for women and men with disabilities to access um, cash-based humanitarian aid, but also social protection and financial services in general. And there's three I want to mention uh, in particular here. And they also relate to some of the things we have seen in the chat. So one is related to the availability of data and identification. So persons with disabilities, they're more likely to be without birth certificate, without ID, being left out in population censuses. So in, in humanitarian programs, we have to make an extra effort to identify them within households. Um, and we do that um, through our own household surveys, but also working together with local organizations of persons with disabilities who often have better data on persons with disabilities in the communities. We make sure that data is that we use is disaggregated not only by gender and age, but also by disability using the Washington group question so we can monitor outcomes for persons with disabilities properly. We also link persons with disabilities then with social services or with the government, government making sure that they're registered. And sometimes, or quite often, we also negotiate for um, alternative ways to access um, digital financial products that we use in our cash program. So, for example, an, an alternative way to prove your identity or to provide a signature on a contract and things like that. Then, secondly, I would like to mention, which we have also heard before, that a main barrier especially in rural areas, is the lack of digital financial services. So in our feasibility studies for cash-based humanitarian programs, one point that comes out most often is the distance to um, cash distribution points like ATMs, banks, but also money agents, which is a challenge for persons with disabilities. And then also the accessibility the physical accessibility of these premises of the cash distribution points. So there's also here, there's several measures which we have to provide in um, humanitarian programs to create equal outcomes for persons with disabilities. And these include, for example, providing transport and also 
some reasonable accommodation measures to ensure the accessibility of physical locations. So the goal is always that persons with disabilities can access cash transfers themselves and not through caregivers. We also advocate directly with the financial service providers we work with and sometimes also through cash working groups for better coverage and more accessible coverage um, with um, digital financial services in our intervention areas. Then the third point I want to mention is that it's important to dig a little bit deeper and understand the patterns of exclusion and the social norms uh, which prevent persons with disabilities from managing their financial affairs in general. So whenever possible, we work together with um, local organizations um, of persons with disabilities to identify these patterns and then provide digital financial literacy trainings and rights awareness trainings um, together with these organizations. And we see in our post distribution monitoring services and uh, um, sorry surveys that the confidence on the use of digital financial products does grow through gaining know how through using the product. And for example, in Bangladesh recently, where we use Bcash also, we provided um, um, cash transfers to mobile wallets and people had their received their own SIM card, their own access code. And we, we heard from people, from persons with disabilities in particular, that this contributed to their empowerment and to their confidence of managing their own finances. And then lastly, I would like to mention a recommendation from the study, which I find an important takeaway now, specifically for us as CBM, as a humanitarian actor. So we're using digital cash transfers basically as the default aid modality um, these days in humanitarian crisis around the world. And for many persons with disabilities, particularly in rural areas, this provides the first time access to formal financial services. And we always implicitly assume that you know, this financial inclusion then leads to more resilience um, after the end of the humanitarian programs, but we don't really explicitly um, include it as an objective of our humanitarian work. And also we don't really systematically monitor it. So this for me, for CBM, this is one of the takeaways. We need to define what we mean by financial inclusion in our um, humanitarian CBI policy. We need to make sure that whenever we can, we include it as a specific objectives in our humanitarian programs, and then also review our tools and indicators like PDM surveys um, to make sure that these, the long-term financial inclusion and also the long-term financial health is monitored throughout the humanitarian phase, but then also recovery and you know, in development or nexus uh, projects. Good, I'll conclude here. Uh, thanks again for the study, for this uh, conducting this relevant study. And I hand back over to you, Astrid. Thanks, Manuel, and lots of good points. And definitely um, measuring the financial health is uh, something very important. And for instance, uh, very aligned now with the way uh, WFP is, uh, is moving. But I suppose many other cash actors are really looking at measuring further um, the how the cash transfer will actually benefit more than the cash value itself. So uh, thank you very much for that. Now I would like to have uh, Clara um, who has worked in many different humanitarian operations. So in light of your experience, Clara, uh, what are the recommendations from the study that you find most helpful to shape cash transfers um, in a way that supports people digital financial inclusion? Over to you. Thanks, Astrid, for the question. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, I know this has been a fascinating webinar and I'm very grateful to be part of the conversation because certainly digital financial solutions has really been a game changer in how we deliver cash and especially at large scale and again enabling the ability to remotely and more regularly push transfers to people. So obviously we saw this very clearly in COVID times when you know the needs expansion exponentially increased while everyone's 
um, access uh, simultaneously was lost, uh, again, due to movement restrictions with opening and closing of borders, etc. cetera. Um, but again, by having engaged in digital financial solutions, for example, with mobile money as a means to transfer cash to people previously, we were able to also instantly push kind of ad hoc support in response to COVID remotely where people were able to cash out from their local agents. I mean, this is huge because that was obviously not entirely planned per se, but it was it enabled for us to do a very timely response to a, a particular emergency. And we were able to do that, for example, with the push of a button to over 20,000 previous cash recipients in Somalia. Um, that was during COVID times. Um, obviously, you know, um, Again, more recently, uh, us as ICRC, we signed an MOU with the Ukrainian Ministry of Social Policy to piggyback off of their pre-identified um, list of vulnerable households, those that were already low-income households pre-crisis uh, of February 24th, um, to, to, for us to be able to provide a top-up of social assistance uh, since the start of the conflict. And this was also reaching 100, over 123,000 people um, you know, quite quickly. Uh, this is something, obviously, that you know, we're benefiting from within a context where the majority of the population are financially included. So really, this is to illustrate you know, the advantage and the importance of what digital financial inclusion can offer um, within our type of work. Um, so obviously there was a lot of good recommendations um, that was presented. Uh, and again, these recommendations serve the majority of the population in enabling financial inclusion. So I really like the offering of kind of, you know, from the, 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 the supply side, sorry, around offering new financial services and products tailoring to the most vulnerable groups, again, who are often those that are financially in excluded. And again, tailoring of our own program design to make sure that there is you know, the right inclusion and also enough longevity for people's engagement with financial services to make sure that we actually benefit uh, from it in the long term. Not we, sorry, but the people, right? This whole thing about financial inclusion and assuming um, that uh, they are going to then, uh, just because they've been introduced to a, a new financial service, that they're all of a sudden going to be engaging with savings and loans and all of these things, I think is also a big jump. Uh, for us in the humanitarian sector. So really the case studies um, that was presented really illustrated the importance of building that solution really both in the back end, but really from the user end as well. Uh, and it's this recommendation on coupling assistance, you know, with digital and financial literacy sessions potentially to help people see that added value and have that continuous engagement in the financial ecosystem beyond the humanitarian assistance timeline is, is I think, critical. Um, for me as well, I think it's, we need to also be better at considering existing financial solutions that people may actually already be engaged with. Um, I think we tend to overlook this as well in the sense that, you know, we often do uh, cash feasibility. We look at what is uh, the type of solutions that people are familiar with and we say, oh, it's mobile money here. But instead of tapping into kind of their existing accounts, for again, practical reasons, for accountability reasons, for whatever reasons, what we do is we will distribute them a new SIM card. Um, you know, this doesn't happen all the time for us and we, we try to change that practice, but I think this is something else as well that we would like to reconsider in terms of how we approach it. And again, making it people-centered, um, more, more, more practical for the people and less, uh, even if that means, um, more work from our end, um, but again, it, it, it promotes and enables that kind of longevity of that, that, that um, the use of that product. Um, I would like to take advantage a little bit in terms of uh, all of the great um, heads and minds in this in this call, again, to advocate a little bit from ICRC perspective, because of course for us, uh, you know, the formal social protection systems are also um, typically quite disrupted or relatively new, or, or again, uh, comes with a lot of different challenges within ICRC context. Um, and so, you know, you was mentioned before by Stephanie and Moisa around the challenges of financial inclusion, right? Digital or otherwise is that it, it assumes that you have to be on the grid. Um, and this works for the majority of the population, but it, it poses additional challenges for, for where we particularly work um, to expand inclusion of people, the vulnerable population that fall out of the system who are typically marginalized, right? So we're talking about refugees, migrants, informal workers, and for us in particular, those in uh, non-government controlled areas or uh, in non-state armed group held territories. It's quite a mouthful, sorry. Um, and again, the potential risk that that brings. So what I mean by this is that all of the challenges that was, uh, you know, mentioned before, 100%, we, we face the same challenges, but even more so because, for example, you know, 
the, the engaging with the financial system governed by national regulatory laws requires that they do data sharing, which is again, not only KYC, so not even just the lack of documentation to be able to engage in the formal financial system, but also the fact that financial service providers have obligations to then report to the central um, bank in case there are matches of, of from on the sanctions list or, or watch list and things like that, which again, you know, very much goes against the protection of, of people um, in, in the areas that we work. So we, of course, do not want to inadvertently expose people um, uh, to, to that type of risk. So, you know, we also, I think, have to recognize that sometimes there are reasons why people, and again, likely those who are the most vulnerable that may choose to intentionally remain out of the system. Uh, and we, as a humanitarian sector, the private sector, whatever, we need to offer a kind of a responsible and safe alternative uh, to, to make sure that we still, uh, that we don't neglect that group. Um, so for me, one of the other recommendations mentioned about ensuring meaningful choice for recipients uh, and ensuring really true consent for me is, is, is key. Uh, right, and if when if and when this is impossible, this opt-out data tracking or sharing of information should kind of really be made kind of a default, especially for sensitive populations. Um, so again, uh, I should mention that, you know, obviously non-state armed group held territories is really where ICRC has a bit of a unique vantage point. Um, so we are trying to deepen our knowledge as well in both the formal and informal social protection systems of these type of areas. And so our research team uh, here is also initiated its research on how we can try to promote sustainable humanitarian impact and exploring social protection in those type of populations in those types of areas. So, you know, um, just to, to say that our initial exercise already uh, highlights that you know, this is this is covering around 50 million people that live under the exclusive control of armed groups. And again, this this is a lot of people that we cannot neglect. So I kind of just want to make a small pitch there for for advocacy for this group. Um, but again, of course, hopefully that the point of that is that you know we we are grateful to be part of this conversation. We want to continue to engage with the social protection community of practice and contribute wherever we can to further this discussion along. Um, and again, that's both as us ICRC, but also through our movement network, right? So in particularly our national societies, which which I'm sure many of you have also um, worked with as well, um, which you know are, are I think best placed uh, in many ways and are have many exemplary cases uh, where they are auxiliary to government playing that supportive role for social protection. Um, so yeah, that's my main takeaways. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Clara. And uh, yeah, just to, to bounce back on uh, one point you highlighted related to choice. I mean, that's uh, an area that WFP is also exploring, but uh, many other stakeholders we've uh, been discussing too, also the organization called G2PX, for instance. Uh, how can we ensure that women and men have the choice on where they want to receive uh, the money that is being transferred. So it's not us making the contract with a mobile money operator, a specific one that we're selecting, but they're telling us where they want to receive, if they have already a SIM card, if they prefer to receive it at a bank, etc. which means that the, it helps to uh, put more competition in the market, which helps also reduce some possible um, abuses of power, for instance, but it also, it's also very uh, important to have a context where in a country there is interoperability so that uh, it's easy to send to uh, the uh, account that women and men choose to receive the money on. So it's kind of uh, very uh, challenging for all our organizations who are um, accustomed to make one contract with one financial service provider and a lot of government are in the same position because they would choose one financial service provider. But uh, this conversation is uh, ongoing and hopefully this will really move towards um, providing much more choice in the future uh, for women and men uh, on where they want to receive because they know best what is uh, good for them. And I suppose in terms of also um, providing um, uh, incentives for uh, financial service provider to design products, for instance, for uh, that are adapted to different disabilities, that are adapted to a specific segment of uh, vulnerable women, etc. If they know that that people can choose uh, the products, then they might have more incentives to do it. And so I just want to open the floor, um, and we will we'll, uh, take uh, the questions that were. 
uh, in the chat. I might start uh, with one that is directly related to what you presented, uh, Clara, so I won't go into the order from that they came uh, in. But there was a question from Ruby um, related to what you explained uh, from uh, Ukraine. So uh, how do the mobile money and digital transfers work when population cross borders? and uh, where uh, they're able to still access funds. In the case of Ukraine, what happened when beneficiaries travel to other countries in the region? Clara, and then if anybody wants to step in also on, on this. Thanks for the question. Um, sorry, maybe I, should, I may have uh, caused the confusion. So it's not necessarily mobile money that we're engaging in uh, in Ukraine. It's actually a direct bank account transfer. Um, again, because within Ukraine, it is quite common for many people to, to already have accounts. And again, because we are working with the ministry, targeting those who are already receiving social assistance from the government, being a low vulnerability, uh, low economic household apologies, um, receiving that assistance via bank account transfers, they, they already have existing accounts. So we are piggybacking off of this kind of the fact that they're, they're already financially included to be able to push that type of transfer directly to their own account. Um, we, as ICRC, I mean, we, were we are targeting specifically residents um, of, of, um, of Ukraine that are staying within uh, the areas close to the line of contact. So in terms of crossing the borders, that's not really um, not that it's not an issue for us, but that's not really the target population um, that we are uh, assisting. However, we did have this conversation for sure. I mean, it's not to say that they're residents now that they won't leave at some point because that line of contact is also extremely volatile. Um, so what we have uh, looked into as well is that actually, you know, the same way as my bank account and your bank account, if you put money into my account, I cross the border, I can withdraw money from another another bank account from an ATM. I can use my card if I if I you know have access to a debit card or whatever outside across the border. Um, certainly, that may come at certain service fees or additional service fees and, and exchange rates and things like that. But that is that remains accessible. Um, so I think that's a huge benefit again when when uh, people are financially included that we could tap into where that assistance is a bit more longer term. Um, and a little less, you know, cash out in one go, and then we may not have access to them again. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you, Clara and Ruby. Uh, just say in the chat if you need some more addition, but I think it was very clear. Uh, a question for Moisa. I mean, I'm, I'm going to group a few questions that came uh, in the chat, but uh, um, there was there were questions from uh, Ambashu, for instance, related to uh, are there specific calls for um, women to rely more on men uh, beyond the issue, the cultural issue, uh, to perform the different cash operation, and maybe um, some if you can add some information that you. Uh, collected during the study related to older people participation um, and the their access to the cash transfer program that would that would uh, be really good uh, there was also a question from lena related to um, the difficulty of uh, access um, despite training so did you hear anything uh, around that and maybe uh, if you can expand a bit more on the social cultural norm which we know are playing such a big role uh, in um, the big gap that still exists in the world uh, between women and men and uh, digital financial inclusion thank you moisa right thanks um just to check you can still hear me right great so i think in in terms of what is one of a big determinant factors for how women use um, and engage with apps as well as general technology around finance differently is it, it's linked to socioeconomic uh, background right it is income who gets the income in the household who is most likely to have that and that kind of determines where you would use or who would be dependent or more familiar with a particular technology. This is not to say that women are not, at least in our group, not financially literate. They use, uh, they, they know exactly how to use cash and where to use it. Their preference is informal financial institutions, something that we didn't cover. But there is a preference for that because of both perceived security, um, as well as knowledge of, you know, if something goes wrong, there is community inbuilt accountability. Uh, which doesn't exist with formal financial institutions, but socioeconomic um, indicators is a huge sort of predictor of how you would engage it. And I think that also applies to men as well. Um, I'm a little bit wary based both on 
what we found in this study, as well as recent work done by IPA in the Philippines, that digital literacy somehow answers everything. Um, because we know that people use financial apps, they use them to withdraw cash transfer, and then they drop it the minute it's finished. So sort of emphasizing that somehow this is all about a lack of knowledge is, is, is not, it's not very credible based on our the kind of work that we've done and also the recent work that's coming on about how people do use it, they are familiar with it when they use it and then they stop. So, um, and then people use it and get familiar with it to the degree they need to. So I think it's not about, design is definitely an issue. We've spoken about that, but very honestly, it's about having products that are useful, having money that is enough. So there's no point asking someone how they're going to use five rupees. Will they buy a credit card with it or will they save with it? when it's just five rupees. So there is something, I, I think there's obviously, you know, that's an obvious point and cash transfers are pegged to a particular particular um, line because of certain reasons. But we have to think about that specific, the specific needs of this population, the specific socioeconomic indicators when we start talking about financial inclusion in the same way that we would talk about, you know, the, the general population that uses Monzo Revolut. Um, the second question was, so definitely there was a difference between men and women, which we spoke about. Um, there was a difference between older men and women and younger older men, women were less kind of familiar, but also less fussed with, you know, wanting to be familiar. It was very much, it wasn't, it wasn't something that they wanted to spend time in doing. They thought it was, you know, it was convenient the way it worked. And, but as we indicated, older women more than older men did say that they would require assistance or require help or just felt less familiar with, for example, using a QR code to do mobile money. I'm not sure what the, re, you know, if, if the reason for that is somehow a one factor thing we can look at, but yes, to speak about the differences between age groups, that's definitely there. But I think that again, to say, you know, I, I think we can extrapolate that, extrapolate that to a lot of income quintiles. This is not a this is the generational divide is not an issue about just the bottom income quintile. Um, Lena's question about access. So just to say that trainings were all about how to use and access cash, right? And trainings we know aren't always useful. They need to be quite, um, the, and there's a wide literature on that, lots of randomized control trials that you'll be able to see. Um, uh, especially, and I think more further work being done now, commissioned now, trainings need to be iterative. They need to be, it, it can't be a one-off training and then it's done. It, it needs to, to, to promote that engagement, to have people use, test something, come back with questions, troubleshoot and come back and say, okay, so I use this, then this happened, et cetera. There needs to be a venue for that. So trainings that are kind of spread out, community delivered, where people feel like they have easy access if something goes wrong, tends to help, but one-off trainings about access tend to be like, okay, we kind of understand this. And then, you know, but there's also someone in our community who understands this more. So we'll just go to them if anything happens. So that's, that's a little bit of a function of the training, uh, I think, and not just, not the content, but the frequency of it and the in-depth nature of it. And again, you know, often how the training is done is different if it's in an emergency versus if a social protection system has been running for a long time. So people actually are familiar and you're just piggybacking on that system to deliver emergency responses. So that's a second point. I think uh, Astrid, are those the questions have I uh, missed? No, I think you've got all the points, uh, Moisa. Thank you very much. Uh, I just pasted in the chat for everyone uh, that there is a, when we published a study with the Center for Financial Inclusion related to um, what works and what doesn't work in terms of actually capability buildings uh, for financial uh, literacy and digital financial literacy, which try to move away from the traditional trainings of trainers approach or classroom based and try to find different approaches where um, we can really help uh, changing behavior. And on that, maybe there was a question um, related to behavioral changes, nudges or messages for cash transfer reception that Hannah put in the chat. So um, I don't know, Stephanie, if uh, you want to step in on this one. Uh, have you seen any uh, of the program uh, that were putting also into um, the design some behavioral, behavioral change nudges 
Um, have you seen anything that works related to that? And maybe Barnaby and you would be able to complement uh, because uh, there were examples from Kenya, maybe where the government was kind of trying to push people to use uh, digital financial products much more to pay uh, for for um, social services, for instance. So I don't know if you have any uh, information on that that you could also share with the floor. Thank you. Over to you, Stephanie. Thanks. Um, I mean, I mean, I don't have any specific examples. I mean, I think this is a bit of a tough question to answer in some ways, too, because on one side, there's a discussion that, that Clara raised around informed consent and agency and choice. And then there's sort of the nudge factors to sort of encourage particular ways of using financial products that might improve or increase digital financial inclusion. And so getting that balance right is hard. I mean, I think one of the sort of general challenges here, maybe Barnaby can speak to specific examples, but um, of why we haven't seen this is just when we're speaking about um, the context in which we're operating here, if it's a disaster response, it's the poorest communities, it's sort of a humanitarian context. Um, thinking about nudge policies almost becomes a, a secondary effect and, and harder to, to focus on because it's such raw or immediate needs or context that, that we're thinking about here. And so I'm not sure if the insights into the operational and context specific factors on the ground that would allow for effective nudge policies that are also very much grounded in people's agencies and ability to opt out. I don't know if we're quite there yet or that type of knowledge or investment has been made. I haven't really seen a lot of examples of that, um, but it would be important to consider that, that those two facts. So one agency and choice, and then on the other side, the specific contextual understanding so you can understand what actually works in particular contexts to sort of encourage um, behavioral change in a nuanced and sort of user-focused way. I don't know if Barnaby or Moisa want to step in on, on that at all as well. Maybe a short, a short intervention because uh, I can see that unfortunately the time is uh, running out so Barnaby any example otherwise we can also type uh, the answer in the chat while we wrap up. Just very quickly to say that, um, no, I agree with that. I mean, our experience from digitizing um, saving loan groups is that people sort of then miss the actual social side of it. And so actually they they may kind of appreciate the digital ease, but actually the sort of wider um, benefits of being in a, in a group. And I think thinking more broadly from a social perspective is the way to create this change rather than it seeing it as just a sort of the efficiency of transfer. Thanks. Thank you very much. So we reached the end of our webinar today. Uh, so I just wanted to um, give a big thanks to all the panelists who joined us today, to um, also our uh, researcher at ODI who presented this study, and uh, maybe just a few announcements before we leave, just to explain that the joint report will be released before the end of the year, and there will be a shorter publication uh, specifically on the views and experiences and perspectives uh, of the men and women who have received a digital cash transfer in Cambodia, Nepal and Bangladesh. So this will also be released by the end of the year. And you can hear also, you'll be able to hear a podcast uh, on DFI, on digital financial inclusion. This will be also posted on the, the page uh, socialprotection.org and it will come out in January 2023. So we really hope that uh, the conversation triggered some interest and some thoughts that will be very useful for your uh, work and for really accompanying men and women on their path to digital financial inclusion. Um, and we'll try and address some of the questions. If they were not, uh, we, can, we can try and address them uh, directly uh, with the people who have uh, sent the question. But a big thanks to everyone, and I wish everyone a good uh, morning, uh, afternoon, evening. Thank you again. Bye.